I've done a number of interviews over the last few years about Alberta Innovates uh, Beyond Bitumen Beyond Combustion Program, which is to find uses for oil sands bitumen other than using it as feedstock for refineries to turn into gasoline and diesel. So I'm going to talk to Paolo Bomben from Alberta Innovates about where that program is at. There's been lots of exciting uh, progress made. So welcome to the interview, Paul. Thank you, Markham. I'm happy to be here. Well, look, let's start off. The, the whole idea behind Bitumen Beyond Combustion is to is to a, a, find an answer to the question, what else can we do with bitumen other than turn it into a fuel and burn it? And there are the one that's most exciting to me, and I, I've written about it and interviewed about it, is using bitumen to turning it into a precursor for carbon fiber manufacturing. Can you give us a bit of an update where that part of bitumen beyond combustion is at? We have proof of concept to turn bitumen into carbon fiber. That's been demonstrated over the past two years at labs around the world. And so that's really exciting. So now that we have demonstrated that proof of concept, the next thing that we need to do is make the carbon fiber in a consistent quality and reproducible quality for customers and end users. And that in and of itself is the biggest challenge that we face going forward. Now, you, uh, Alberta Innovates launched a uh, um grand challenge, carbon fiber grand challenge. And you've had scientists from around the world, many of them from Canada, We've interviewed a few of them. And everyone says that these the science and the technical issues can be can be solved. And is is that been the case? That, that, is that what you found as part of the uh, challenge? The teams are working through uh, resolving those challenges as we speak. We just launched our second phase, which is to, uh, you know, take to, to really put more in-depth focus into addressing those challenges. You know, the big thing with making carbon fiber is what you put into the process equals what you get out. So if you put in a really bad starting material, you're going to get a bad carbon fiber product out the other end. We know that bitumen contains impurities like sulfur and metals. To what extent those impact the final product is what the teams are right now exploring in phase two. And based on what they tell us, we can then go back and say, what do we need to do to bitumen up front so that the input into the manufacturing process gives us a consistent, high quality carbon fiber at the very end. Now, uh, I did a magazine article for uh, Alberta Views uh, uh, this past March, and I interviewed Alex Walk from Zoltec, uh, which is a carbon fiber manufacturing in Missouri. And, and he said, look, we think that Alberta Innovates will solve this and we'll get a precursor, high quality, and maybe even as low as half the price of what we're currently using. That opens up big markets in auto manufacturing and so on. Are you still confident that that's where you're gonna uh, land with, uh, with carbon fiber? I believe we still have a good line of sight to getting there. Uh, the process and the starting components from bitumen are substantially less expensive than those that are used to make carbon fiber today. And so because we were beginning with that lower starting point in cost, we have some room to negotiate in terms of how much uh, you know, processing we do up front and how much cost we, we put into it uh, and still stay underneath those um, cost targets that Alex was talking about. So I'm still confident in based on what I'm seeing the teams um, doing right now and in the research that's ongoing that we can still address that in a cost effective manner. Now, uh, there are other uh, end uses for bitumen other than making it into carbon fiber. Could you tell us about some of those and where the research is at? One of our, what we see is the closest, um, the, the nearest term opportunity for increasing non-combustion products from bitumen is asphalt binder, asphalt cement. It's the glue that holds the as asphalt roads together, all the aggregate together. And we've been doing research over the past two years, supporting research uh, that has benchmarked our asphalt cement binder relative to those from around the world. And what was found is that bitumen from Alberta has a naturally low wax content. And that low wax content actually gives it or, or, or prevents cracking at low temperatures. And so you get an, act, an actually longer lasting road. It's more durable, more reliable, more res resilient over time by using asphalt binder from Alberta. The challenge with asphalt binder right now 
it's only a regional product because it has to be shipped hot. So we're also looking at how do we ship it at ambient temperature. If we can do that, we can unlock markets across North America and around the world. How close are you to solving that problem? There are a number of researchers and companies exploring the ambient temperature transport of asphalt binder. And I believe in the next three to five years that will be unlocked and we'll have the opportunity to use existing infrastructure like the coal terminals on the west coast of Canada or rail infrastructure to move it at ambient temperature across uh, the continent and around the world. Now, this is one of the most important questions that I've come up uh, against when you know, folks are, the, the skeptics come out of the, the woodwork. And, and that is uh, between carbon fiber and asphalt binder and whatever other uses you come up with for bitumen, can that uh, be a, replace uh, the three and a half to four million barrels a day of bitumen that's produced in the oil sands uh, and basically displace it so that all of that bitumen is used for a non-combustion purpose? Can it do that? Right now, uh, you know, we're, we're probably talking about only half the barrel. And that's because the, the, the chemicals that are required to make carbon fiber, to make asphalt binder, come from the heaviest part of the barrel, which is roughly about half the barrel. So there still is that other half that is the light ends, which are typically used to make gasoline and diesel and other fuels. So that still right now, we do not have a non-combustion end use for it. We focused on the heavier ends because that's where the chemistry is easier right now to get to the products we want. Our intention is to use the uh, revenues and the success from the heavy part of the barrel to fund research into the lighter end of the barrel closer to the end of this decade. And we'll find non-combustion uses for the, the lighter end of the barrel, but that requires us first to get through the heavier end uh, to, to make it work. Sure. Uh, is it fair to say, Paulo, that, that once you get to the lighter end of the barrel, that essentially, you know, that is similar in, in viscosity, say, to, you know, other light to sweet crudes? And does that make the, the process of finding another uh, use for it, does it make it more difficult to be competitive? It is. It does have a similar viscosity to light crudes. Um, certainly, uh, exactly what will depend on the on exactly how the cut is made. It it is it does become a challenge then because now we'd have to see what we're competing against in the market in terms of how much revenue could you get by selling that barrel for to make or the light end of the barrel to make uh, a combustion fuel. However, you know, in a world that becomes increasingly constrained uh, for uh, for you know, oil and gas fuels, if, if we do move towards some of these net zero scenarios that people are talking about, then there is likely um, a play to be made on the light end of the barrel to make it into a non into non combustion products. What those products are, we don't know yet. We haven't really we haven't spent any time thinking about it to be honest. However, it is on our radar as we know that's where we need to go next once we address the heavier end of the barrel. Great. Well, uh, Paulo, thank you very much for this update. Really appreciate it. Uh, I mean, this this is exciting. I, I've seen the uh, economic projections that Alberta Innovates has put out three to four times more value per barrel, uh, which we assume will translate in also into more jobs and, and into a greater government revenues, for instance. So it, it sounds like this has a uh, terrific economic uh, potential as well as the environmental potential. It certainly does, and that's why we're continuing to explore this uh, pathway. Thanks very much for your uh, insights, Paula. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Markham. Thank you for your time.